Open your Bibles with me to the book of James, chapter 3. The book of James, chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1, and I'll read down through verse 12. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned around with a sm very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature. We're going to come back to that, underline that. Setteth on fire the course of nature. That is a profound passage. We could build a whole message around that one, that one statement, but I'm going to deal with it a little bit more later in the message. But you need to be sure that you identify that somehow in your Bible. It defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed, and hath been tamed, tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Now back to chapter 3 and verse 1, I want to read what Albert Barnes has to say about that verse. My brethren, be not many masters. Be not many of you teachers, is his paraphrase of that statement. Be not many of you teachers. This, this is so, so sagacious. The evil referred to is that where many desired to be teachers, though but few could be qualified for the office, and though in fact comparatively few were required, a small number, well qualified, would better discharge the duties of the office, the preacher, and do more good than many would, and there would be great evil in having many crowding themselves unqualified into the office. Do you understand what he is saying? The devil's most effective strategy to deceive mankind is to fill up 
the religious world with preachers and teachers who are either, number one, false prophets promoting lies, or number two, thoroughly unqualified for the office, meaning that they have not been called to the office and they are using the office for their own advancement, comfort, and well-being. The Word of God is saying it is a crime against humanity. It is a sin against God. I need more volume or something isn't quite right. For there to be so many unqualified preachers crowding the message that people hear because with so many voices preaching untruth, lies, distortions, etc., the people's minds are bombarded with so many unqualified voices that they become confused as to what is true and what is not true, and thus the devil has thoroughly confused the minds of people to what is true. And that is what's happening today as never before. Because of the mediums that we have electronically, and now through cyberspace, to be able to get messages out has opened the door for every charlatan and every phony prophet to preach untruth and thus compound the confusion that people are hearing in the name of God. False prophets and unqualified preachers fill up the airways, cyberspace, television, and videos, and the printed word. Everywhere you turn, you are subjected to a false prophet and an unqualified preacher. It is a cacophony of lies and deception. And that's what we have in America today a cacophony of lies and deception. I get letters daily from people who say something like this. Chuck, you really need to watch this video. You really need to watch this man. You really need to take a look at this. And all I have to do is watch for about 90 seconds. And it is very obvious that the person that this writer is so enamored with, so in love with, that they've got to write me and say, I've really got to watch this individual, implying there's something this individual is going to teach me that I don't know. And I watch for about 90 seconds, and within that period of time, I discover this person is a false teacher. This person is spreading lies. But these people that are listening think that they are hearing some profound revelation from heaven. And all they are hearing is the deception of the wicked one who's using a plethora of these unqualified false prophets confusing the hearts and the minds of people which in the end will destroy and damn their souls. 
verses 5 through 8. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Oh, does it ever, if you don't believe that, you haven't heard Donald Trump. <laughs> Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. It defileth the whole body, your whole being, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and birds and serpent and things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. You know, I have preached and read from this passage countless times. And for some reason, the revelation of that one phrase never really hit me until this week as I prepared this message. Setteth on fire the course of nature, the tongue, the tongue spoken by evil people, the tongue spoken by undiscerning people, the tongue spoken by mean-spirited people, the tongue spoken by wicked people, people, setting on fire the course of nature. Now there, here again in the Holy Bible, we find a reference to God's natural laws. All these pastors that ignore the laws of nature are ignoring a vast host of passages of the Word of God, Old and New Testaments, such as this passage. This is a reference to God's natural laws. And he's saying the tongue, the misuse of the tongue, the evil use of the tongue, has the potential and power to set on fire the course of nature. When pastors preach falsehood from the pulpits, as the vast majority of them are, or when they refuse to use their tongue to preach truth, it's a two-way street. The tongue is guilty sometimes by what it says. Are you with me? Yes. I'm going slowly because I want you to understand this. The tongue can be guilty in two ways. The tongue can be guilty by what it says, or the tongue can be guilty by what it doesn't say. Some people are guilty of both. They use the tongue to say the wrong things, and then they use the tongue to refrain from saying good things. So they are guilty twice over by what they say and by what they don't say. Sometimes what we don't say is as sinful and wicked as what we do say. And I would say that maybe, as far as the pulpits of America are concerned, what they are not saying is the greater transgression. Because many of them will say good things to a point. And people will say, oh, what a wonderful pastor we have. Listen to what he just said. Listen to what he didn't say. We'll tell you whether or not your pastor is truly a man of God. 
but setting on fire the course of nature. What's going on in our country today? They call it wokeism, right? Wokeism is nothing more than an attempt to set God's natural laws on fire. And by setting those laws on fire to destroy those laws. What they are trying to do is to change and destroy God's natural laws. And they are succeeding. Today, major corporations are advancing this anti-natural law campaign not just on the adult mind but they are targeting the minds and the hearts of little boys and girls they are trying to change God's natural law implanted into our soul at the time of creation or for us at the time of conception. Laws that are given us by God, that moral, natural law of our creator and Corporations like Anheuser-Busch and Target and so many other of the big corporations have gone full bore in trying to attack the natural laws of God. And they're doing it by attacking the minds and the hearts of children. Jesus said something about that, didn't he? Amen. Woe to him that offendeth these little ones. It is better for them that a millstone were hanged about their neck and they were cast into the sea than that they should offend one of these little ones. These corporate executives have no idea of the anger they are inciting from Almighty God against them for their attack on the boys and girls of America. They cannot imagine the hell that awaits them. And it's ubiquitous, although some are more bold than others, such as Anheuser-Busch and Target. Anheuser-Busch, since it's gone woke, has lost somewhere in the neighborhood, and I didn't bring the facts with me. You can go to my website at chuckbaldwinlive.com, and I've got stories on this that I follow with the exact numbers on it. So if I'm off a little bit, it's because I didn't bring it with me. But they've lost somewhere in the neighborhood, and this is just in a few weeks since all this started. They have lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 27 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars. The Bud brand, the Budweiser brand is forever ruined. So thankfully there are enough people in the United States today that recognize, at least they recognize the attack against nature. And they still understand the natural laws of which God has put into their hearts. Target has lost somewhere around 16 billion or somewhere in that vicinity. Both of these corporations are 
hemorrhaging profits. Their stock is down dramatically on the New York Stock Exchange. Stockholders are bailing out on their stocks. They are cutting back personnel. They are feeling the effects of this. And yet, from what I can tell, there seems to be no conscience in these in these executives, and they seem determined to continue with this woke agenda that is destroying their own business. Our motto when it comes to the way we spend our money, and I'm talking about in this room, and I'm talking about those of you online, should be go woke, go broke. Amen. At this point, if I were a beer drinker, and I'm not, I would sure give up Budweiser, that's for certain. And I will never shop at Target again, at least not until drastic changes are made with their corporate policy. Set on fire the course of nature. These politicians that are promoting the woke agenda in our country are setting on fire the course of nature. They're trying to change the natural world into the utopian, devilish world of their own making. I'll say more about this later, but I'm just going to mention this. I hope I haven't put too many of you to sleep yet. The fact that they are targeting children with the message of transgenderism. Children pre-kindergarten children promoting transgenderism in the minds and the hearts of these little boys and girls which is against nature not to mention the revealed laws of God They are preparing society. You can write me all the mail you want. I'm standing by what I'm about to say. I don't know if I'll live long enough to see the fruition of what I'm saying today, but many of you in this room and in the audience are going to live long enough to see the fruition of what I'm saying right now. They are preparing the children and society itself for the acceptance of pedophilia. And they will scream, that is not true. But that is exactly what they are doing. They are preparing children and society itself for the acceptance of pedophilia. And one of these days, whether I'm alive or not, you're going to wake up and you're going to read the paper and you're going to hear the news and you're going to go online and on your phone and you're going to read coming across the wire. I'm already reading stories online about how WHO and other organizations such as that are surreptitiously promoting pedophilia in their organizations. This is what's next on the agenda. Setting on fire the course of nature. So when pastors refuse to use their tongues to warn their congregations 
of the evil that's happening around them, they are guilty of setting on fire the course of nature. They are just as guilty in absentia as Bud Light and Target and all these crummy corporations are in promoting it vocally. The lack of opposition is as guilty as those who are promoting it. But so are the tongues within the congregation of our churches. The backbiting, gossiping, slander, and fault finding that dominates the whole of Christendom is a foul stench in the nostrils of a holy God and a cause of God's withheld blessings and power upon the church. You know, a long time ago, uh, let me tell you, I don't care who you are, you have not had more lies told about you than I have had told about me. You have had no more mistreatment than I have had. The opposition, the backbiting, the backstabbing, the lies is not just local for me, it's national. There are preachers in this country who take my sermons and then they get up in the pulpit and online and they tear apart my sermons piece by piece trying to show me to be a false teacher. Especially this was true relating to the prophecy messages and Israel and related subjects. And they do this every week. Every week I have people tell me, oh, did you hear what Pastor so-and-so said about you last week? Well, no, but yes. And this is every week for me. Every week, every day, somebody calls me the dirtiest name you can ever be called. I know what it feels like. When I was a young preacher, am I boring some of you? Am I, am I, have I done something? When I was a young preacher, that really bothered me. It really did. First, it hurt. And then after I got over the hurt, then I became angry and bitter against them. But then I discovered something. My bitterness and resentment against someone else who has hurt me is not hurting them one bit. They're not losing one minute's sleep over the thought that I might resent them. In fact, if they knew that I did, it would make them feel good that they were so important that I would spend so much time thinking about them. It would encourage them to do more against me if they knew that I was carrying hard feelings about them. That means if I'm thinking about them, I'm not thinking about something else. I'm not thinking about the Lord's work. I'm not thinking about the preaching. I'm not thinking about the, the message and what we need to do. I'm, my mind is, con, is filled with resentment and bitterness against this person. So I'm being distracted. This person, this lousy creep of a person has caused me to lose focus on the things that God has given me to do. 
How dare I give that person that much importance? <laughs> Secondly, I discovered that the bitterness that I'm carrying against this bozo is affecting my relationship with the Lord. Because God cannot communicate with a bitter spirit. God cannot bless a bitter spirit. So my relationship with the Lord, my communication with the Lord is stymied to the degree that I allow someone to place bitterness inside of my heart. So thank God decades ago, decades ago, I learned how to take all of that without any reference of bitterness, hatred, and resentment building up in my heart against them. Now, as the shepherd of this flock, I will fight to protect this flock. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the inner resentment that could be caused by someone who attacked you. So I'm saying all that to help you. Because if you let yourself get bitter and angry in your spirit against anybody, I don't care what they've done, how, how much they've hurt you, you are putting a barrier between yourself and God that he cannot bless until you get rid of that bitterness. Confess it to the Lord and let the communication and the love between you and Christ be unfettered and free of any of that. Quite frankly, your critics and the people that hate you are not worth you losing your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not worth it. <laughs> Verses 13 through 18. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your heart, glory not. And the last phrase, lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. If there's confusion anywhere, you can count on the fact that there's envying and strife there. Where there's smoke, there's fire. The fire is the envying and strife. The smoke is the confusion. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. A few notes here before I close. Verse 14, and lie not against the truth. To know the truth, you first must desire to know the truth. To know the truth, you must desire. You must want to know the truth. <laughs> Believe it or not, a lot of people don't. They don't care. Number two, to know the truth, you must ask God to show you truth. God reveals truth to us. That's how we know it. God reveals it. It is a gift of God. The revelation of truth is a gift of God. So you must ask God to show you truth. Number three, to know the truth, Jesus Christ must be the center of your life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man cometh unto the Father but by Jesus. 
not by the Pope, not by baptism, not by obeying the law of Moses, not by church membership. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth. So if Jesus is the truth, our lives must be centered in him in order to know the truth that he possesses. People that do not know Christ cannot know the truth that Christ possesses. When you know Christ, he will give you the truth of Christ. To understand the truth of the Bible, you must understand the distinction. Please let me finish this. To understand the truth of the Bible, you must understand the distinction between national and physical Israel and spiritual and eternal Israel. If you do not understand the distinction between those two Israels, you will never, ever understand the Bible. Both Testaments, old and new. You have to understand and distinguish between the national and physical Israel and the spiritual and eternal Israel. That's where the Israel packages that I preached will really help you. This is set one. There are two other sets. There's three total, 31 messages on the truth from the Bible about Israel. Again, to understand the truth of the Bible, you must understand the distinction between national and physical Israel and spiritual and eternal Israel. If you never come to an understanding of those two Israels, you will never ever understand the Bible. And 80% of the evangelicals in America do not understand that distinction. That means right off the bat, okay, come on, right out of the gate, 80% of the messages you are hearing from evangelical pastors is untrue and contradictory to the word of God because they have never distinguished between those two Israels. And by not distinguishing, they're confusing scripture, misapplying scripture, misinterpreting scripture, and misteaching scripture. So to understand the Bible, you've got to understand the, that, that distinction. National and physical Israel was temporal. It expired at the destruction of Jerusalem. It no longer exists. It will never, ever again exist. It's done, complete, forever, finished. Anybody who was looking for a future physical national Israel is teaching falsehood and they don't understand the truth of the Bible. Spiritual and eternal Israel is everlasting. It began with the person of Jesus Christ and will live forever in the new Jerusalem. To, end, to understand the truth about eschatology. You must understand the truth that prophecy and the book of Revelation are centered in Jesus, not Israel. The prophecy packages, set one and set two, delve into this at length. Inside prophecy message number one is a message called God's Chosen People. The title is longer than that, but God's Chosen People from Revelation chapter 11. That message 
is unknown to 80% of the Christians in America today. 80% of the pastors. God's chosen people. In set two, there's a message called the preeminence of the new covenant. That message is unknown to over 80% of America's pastors and Christians. And the last message of, from prophecy, from Revelation, uh, that I've preached is message number 15, right? In the 15? Y'all don't know. <laughs> what number is it? I don't know. I think it's number 15. The seventh trumpet, the fall of Jerusalem, and the rise of the new covenant kingdom. That is the last one I preached. That's the one I'm trying to get everybody to watch before I preach the next message, which will be preached later on here in the month of June. Those will teach you clearly the meaning of this, what I just said. To understand eschatology, you must understand the truth that prophecy in the book of Revelation are centered in Jesus, not Israel. The entire evangelical world, for the most part, have centered prophecy around the non-existent state of Israel. I say non-existent because it's not a biblical Israel. It's not scriptural Israel. Zionist Israel is not Bible Israel. And so they've centered the entire understanding of prophecy around a, a faux Israel, which shows you how off all of their interpretations of the book of Revelation are going to be. If your presupposition is based upon something that doesn't even exist, what kind of interpretations are you going to come up with? And that's why you've got all these weird, bizarre interpretations floating around out there that people come up with because it's based on nothing. They're just making it up. That's because they don't understand what I'm telling you here. To understand the truth of liberty and government, you must understand God's natural laws of creation. The message I preached a few weeks ago is so important. The lack of fighting Parsons is destroying America. And that title says it all. It says it all. If you have not yet purchased this DVD, please get it, watch it, and share it with your friends. I go into a lot of the history of colonial pastors and churches and as it relates to the Bible, it's a tremendous message of truth relative to this topic about good government, law, and natural law. My series, Natural Law, Liberty, and Government, I think there's 10 messages in this package, will help you understand God's natural laws. And of course, the freedom documents, which we are pre-selling right now on Thursday they'll be printed and then we'll be selling them for the next two to three weeks is that and then they'll be sold out this is the compilation of the great American God most college graduates most PhDs most congressmen, most doctors, most scientists, most educators, most preachers have no clue of the natural law principles in our founding documents. They are not taught at any level and they haven't been taught for decades and decades. Our young people know nothing about these documents and the principles behind them. 
These are the documents that created the greatest free country to ever exist, and the people living in this country have never read those documents and therefore are ignorant of those principles. Liberty Fellowship is dedicated to teaching the truth. The truth about biblical Israel, the truth about liberty and natural law, the truth about the principles of good government based on God's natural laws, the new covenant gospel of Christ, which has thoroughly abolished the old covenant and is totally void of any mixture of works salvation. That is what Liberty Fellowship is dedicated to teaching. How many preachers and churches do you know are teaching any one of those subjects to their people? To know the truth clearly, I say this, and for a lot of you, it's going to go in one ear and right out the other. I accept that. I know it's true, but you'll give an account for that, not me. Because I've told you the truth. Whether you listen to it or not, it's between you and God. Your blood is free from my hands because I've told you the truth. To know the truth clearly, you must turn off the cacophony of lies that saturate our country today. And if you don't know that, if you don't do that, you are going to be confused for the rest of your life. And again, that's your fault and nobody else's. You've been listening to too many false prophets, too many false teachers, too many deceivers, too many liars. The cacophony of lies has inundated your brain and you cannot think straight. And the truth is never clear because you're listening to the cacophony of lies. And now that I've said it, you're going to go get in the car and you're going to turn on the cacophony of lies. Many people have heard me preach for years and they're still listening to these false preachers. I don't know what else I can do except tell you the truth and tell you that you're accountable for whether or not you adhere to the truth. And if you are listening to these false preachers, when you stand before God, you're not going to be able to blame the false preachers for your confusion of truth. You are to blame yourself for listening to the false preacher. Own up to it. Verses 16 through 18. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Verse 18, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. I love that phrase. And I'm just about done, and a lot of you are glad. Albert Barnes writes this, in so, is sown in peace, is sown in peace. It is scattered over the world in a peaceful manner. That is, it is not done amidst contentions and brawls and strifes. The farmer sows his seed in peace. The fields are not sown amidst the tumults of the mob or the excitements of a battle or a camp. Nothing is more calm, peaceful, quiet and composed than the farmer as he walks with measured tread over his fields, scattering his seed. So it is righteousness in the world. It is done 
by men of peace. Hear that? It is done by men of peace. In the, it is done in peaceful scenes with a peaceful spirit. It is not in the tumult of war or amidst the hoarse brawling of a mob. In a pure and holy life, in the peaceful scenes of the sanctuary, by noiseless and unobtrusive laborers, the seed is scattered over the world. And the result is seen in an abundant harvest in producing peace and order. I love that. The new covenant gospel is the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace can only be advanced by men of peace. If you have war in your heart, you are not capable of advancing the gospel of peace. You can't. The gospel of peace can only be advanced by men of peace. Unsaved men will only be converted by hearing the gospel of peace. And the reason they're not being converted today in large portion is because they're not hearing men of peace preach the gospel of peace. They are listening to men of war preach war. And that saves no one. The gospel is the gospel of peace. Christ is the prince of peace. Peaceful men will win the hearts of the unsaved who in the depth of their soul are searching for peace. War they can find anywhere. Discordance, animosity, hatred, bigotry, prejudice, they can find anywhere. But true peace is the message they never hear. And it's the only message that will win the unsaved man to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Evangelicals today who are promoting Zionism and war are enemies of the new covenant gospel of peace. They can say all they want about how they're preaching the gospel. But if they are promoting Zionism and war on behalf of Zionism, they are the enemies of the new covenant gospel of peace because they are not men of peace. Amen. Remember, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. Beloved, Determined to know truth. Determined to not be given over to devilish deception. Determined to temper your tongue and avoid contracting a bitter spirit. And determined to sow the new covenant gospel in peace. Let's stand for prayer.